The Pixel 7 Pro may be arguably the best made by Google device to date, but where does that leave the Pixel 7? Here are our long-term thoughts six months after launch. Thanks for watching 95 Google here on YouTube. Remember to thumbs up, hit subscribe, and then tap the bell icon to be among the first to watch our upcoming videos. Before we get right into the meat of this video, this is a partner piece to our long-term look at the Pixel 7 Pro. That video echoes much of the sentiments of the main experience of both of these devices. So go check that video out before watching this. You'll find a link below, but without any further ado, let's get into it. So Google's entry flagship for late 2022 and the majority of 2023 is smaller and more squared off than the Pixel 7 Pro's more rounded aesthetic. And it's hard to slap the small flagship tag on this device but it's certainly a more compact option that is an important distinction for anyone wanting a premium product with more pocketable dimensions. The core formula though does remain identical to the Pixel 6 from last year or the year before, but with more emphasis on that smaller size. Decreasing the screen from 6.4 to 6.3 inches should be negligible. Instead though, it's a meaningful difference given the smaller side rails on offer here. I do though miss the matte black finish on the extremities of the chassis, which was a playful throwback to the Pixel 4 series on the Pixel 6, but it is removed here and it probably is for the better later down the road as there's certainly a greater cohesion, although that brushed aluminium frame looks vastly superior to shiny glossy metal found on the Pixel 7 Pro series. It does also seemingly hide scratches and scuffs a little bit more readily too. That's something definitely for you to know. When using similarly priced entry level flagships, the Pixel 7 has the edge though when it comes to usability. While I wouldn't call it small in the traditional sense, it has a grated one-handed usability. The flat front panel provides a lip for better in-hand manipulation without requiring hand contortion. I regularly use this device without a case because the svelte dimensions deserve to be appreciated. Button placement as well on the side on the right side of this device is perfect with the volume keys and power button always within reach. The fingerprint scanner also is therefore marginally easier to stretch to and it feels more accurate because you've got full coverage with your digits. When switching back and forth between the Pixel 7 and the 7 Pro, I've got to say though that I am instantly attached to this smaller footprint and now we're on the cusp of that Pixel 7a launch, I'm intrigued to what an ever more compact Google phone can offer throughout late 2023. The lemongrass finish has been perfect as well for hiding fingerprints and scuffs, so I'm content, as I mentioned, to use this without a case more often than not. I'd be lying though if I said I didn't miss the two-tone finishes which were used previously. The colors this year, or at the latter hand of last year, feel more muted, but it's a cohesion process to create a visible design language across the entire series. Picking the brightest color is definitely though well worth it in my opinion. The lemongrass is the best of the series as far as I'm concerned. Like the Pro though, the design has that protruding camera bar. It itself is susceptible to dings and scratches. If you do, like me, use it without a case, the matte brushed finish hides these well, but I do often pair the Google's official Pixel case with this device fairly often if I do worry about dropping it when I'm out and about. This has been the perfect extension of the device, albeit a little bit bulkier than I would personally like. A slim case is something I would suggest unless masses of protection are going to be a priority for you if you're going to hang on to this phone for a long time into the future. As I mentioned, a case might be worth it as well as some of the screen edges themselves can feel a little sharp at times, even with a screen protector on. The rounded frame edges are infinitely though more comfortable than the Pixel 7 Pro as they don't dig into your hands quite as much, but the areas such as this that Google I think really needs to pay more attention to moving forward, especially as like the Pixel 7 Pro, the build quality has improved substantially across the board. In many ways, the Pixel 7 has seen greater improvement in this regard as well too. There's zero chassis flex and the phone also feels more densely packed in the hand without being overly heavy or unwieldy. This has been one of the most pleasing aspects of the Pixel 7 for me, as I found that the Pixel 6, which I did use for almost a full year, had a few issues with extensive usage. No such problems appear to be here, at least after six months of use and abuse and on and off with the Pixel 7 Pro alongside this for me. One key differentiator though between the Pixel 7 and 7 Pro is the usage of a flat AMOLED screen on that base model, which might be attractive to you. I'm going to ask a bit of a rhetorical question here though, and I'm wondering if our people are over curved screens. It does seem to, or at least appears to be so, especially as more phones are starting to return to flat panels. 
At 90 Hertz, I've got to say this is a good screen with solid viewing angles and that improved 1400 nit peak brightness is also a nice extra. Up in that max brightness is definitely a big boost, an important boost for outdoor viewing, but I wouldn't say it's exactly perfect because direct lighting does obscure the dark theme when that's applied on this device a little bit too much for my liking. I do think we're also overdue a 120 Hertz panel, so we're not giving Google a complete pass here, especially if that Pixel 7a launches with a 90 Hertz screen as expected, but we'll just have to wait and see what that has in store. I would also state, like the Pixel 7 Pro, make sure you use the fork force peak refresh rate option in developer options to ensure the smoothest experience with this fairly good screen, all things considered. The UI scaling though, I will say as well on top of that is on the default settings might need to be tweaked if you're used to bigger phones out there. Sometimes text and certain interface content can be a little bit hard to see, especially if you have bad vision. That said, a quick change in the display settings does make all the difference. It's a borderline exceptional screen that is enhanced with that higher refresh rate. This isn't technically the peak Pixel phone right now as that Honor definitely belongs to the 7 Pro. A 10 G2 processor definitely still makes a cut with this device, but the RAM itself is capped at eight gigabytes. And in some regions, you can only pick up this device with 128 gigabytes of UFS 3.1 storage, which could be a bit of a frustration for some of you out there who like to have lots of apps and photos on your device. You can definitely see that there's lots of the first generation tensor problems have been ironed out. Six months though after launch, it's starting to fall behind the flagship chipset pack, but we're not sure that that matters all that much for most people. Using the Pixel 7 day in day out is a super slick experience regardless. It feels definitely in lockstep with the Pixel 7 Pro, which of course has more RAM, but all of those same core internals. At no point does this device get bogged down or laggy. It can run a little hot here and there, and which might lead to some thermal throttling if you do start to push things and do lots of intensive tasks and running demanding applications. In those instances, Google's move to an internally developed chip can feel a little bit annoying, where, especially when the Qualcomm Snapdragon Gen 1 and now the inf infinitely superior Gen 2 are leading the way for Android and could, and potentially as some of you out there may suggest, should have been used here. Heat management definitely needs to be a major focal point for the next Tensor processor. Mobile gamers should probably steer clear of this device, but for the average buyer, you have a wealth of functions and features baked into Android 13 that you'll likely love, and the Pixel 7 will run just as fast as you probably will ever need it to. Sure, there are masses of new additions in the Android 13 build that did launch alongside the Pixel 7. The latest builds, they just start to feel more cohesive and consistent, especially since that misstep with the Android 12 launch. Elsewhere though, it is a clean, light and slick experience, as you'd expect with one of the closest builds to AOSP available. Switching out the scanner on the Pixel 7 series has been an important one, and even after registering my thumbprint just once, I'm getting fairly fast unlocks with absolutely zero issues or problems. It's still not exactly fast as maybe some of the best in the industry, but Google has tuned the speed so that it's marginally quicker some six months on. The face unlock option is bundled in here, and this is software based, and it feels like a backup option, and honestly something that I can't say I've used that often, given that the fingerprint scanner has improved substantially for me. The images that this device produces are practically identical to its bigger brother, especially with the main and wide lenses as those are identical. Despite being a dual camera system, it can do almost everything that you can ask of a modern smartphone. Although I will say not having a dedicated telephoto lens is a bugbear, but a forgivable one for a device under $600. Even without this extra lens, the Pixel 7 I think has a flagship grade camera. Super Res Zoom does help make up for the fact that it doesn't have a telephoto lens and it has improved dramatically now that it can use an enhanced image sensor cropping technique to get borderline usable results up to eight times zoom with some digital and post-processing sharpening thrown in. This is probably going to be fine for moderate usage, but the five times zoom on the Google Pixel 7 Pro is something I do sorely miss when doing touristy things or wanting to punch in to get a really clear view of something and not lose quality. The two times punching on this main lens though is almost as good as a dedicated zoom lens for what it's worth. And it's great if you don't lose out on quality when reframing a subject, for instance, and something I highly recommend. It is a shame though that we can't get a Pixel 4 type deal with a wide and telephoto camera system rather than a wide and an ultra wide setup. Sure, it's going to make more sense for most people out there, but a telephoto is infinitely more useful to me 
than a wider field of view. As well on top of that, the 50 megapixel main sensor does have a decent field of view right out of the gate, plus working autofocus, which is actually missing on the ultra wide lens here and something I have found a little bit frustrating, meaning I've avoided that lens for the most part. One of the things that's most impressive is that the HDR processing on a phone at this price point is as good as, if not better than most flagship tier phones. Low light and moving subjects and just about any photographic scenario are really well catered for. Sadly though, the macro mode is not available on the regular Pixel 7. It would have been one of those nice to have options, but the lack of a telephoto is probably why we can't use it here. That said, after six months with both devices on and off, I can't say it's a huge loss all the same. Like the Pixel 7 Pro, images are always well exposed with tack sharp photos almost guaranteed no matter the lighting conditions. I find that sometimes lens flares can be added after the post processing is applied, but this is a bit of a rarity and something that I only tend to see when I'm shooting directly into sunlight, something you shouldn't do anyway. Unless you're willing to go with an older flagship phone such as the Galaxy S21 or S22 Ultra for instance, then I think there are very few Android phones offering such excellent point and shoot results at this price category. And that even includes many current flagship level handsets over that thousand dollar threshold. And it's easy to say, simply put, I have to say this is the best bang for buck Android smartphone camera, period. Sadly, that only applies to the stills capabilities of this device. And while video itself is fairly solid, it's still a weak point for the Pixel series camera systems, especially when compared to point and shoot photography. It's fine as I mentioned, and I've abused that 4K 60fps recording capability with all lenses, including the selfie camera, absolutely no end while using the device since launch. Focus tracking though and overall video quality does need to be tuned to start to properly compete with Samsung and Apple. Plus on top of that, the overheating when shooting high frame rate video at 4K has become incredibly tiresome you maybe won't be able to shoot past that eight minute barrier before things start to crash and become problematic. And I do think Google needs to fix their heat retention or heat dissipation capabilities of their camera systems. But overall, pretty okay. You'll get the videos that you need to get with this phone. A long lasting battery is almost guaranteed with the Google Pixel 7, even despite packing a fairly middling 4,355 milliamp hour internal cell. I'm actually able to get just short of two days with moderate usage with my particular unit. That's more than enough for my own use case, but it might fall short of anyone tied to their screen for 10 plus hours per day. I have found that I can squeeze out more hours of usage here than I can with the Pixel 7 Pro, which itself has a fairly solid battery for me. That probably doesn't come as much of a huge surprise, at least when we consider that the Pixel 6 offered greater longevity than its stablemate last year. It's impressive given that cell limitation, but it's not overly so, I will say that to contradict myself. The biggest reason why it's not as impressive maybe could be that we're starting to see devices packing the Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, and they can hit two days on with the same sort of usage without really breaking a sweat, and maybe even beyond that if you're a light user. To get anywhere close to that, you'll need to avoid any power intensive applications to get beyond a day of lifespan from the Pixel 7 comfortably. For most people, that's no doubt going to be fine though. Anyone that needs more juice, and I think you should probably be looking elsewhere in our opinion, up your budget and look at anything with a Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 processor and you will, won't be leaving unhappy. A midday resuscitation might be needed with the Pixel 7 if you glue to your phone screen or require access to battery sapping apps like Google Maps all day long here too. One complaint though that applies across the entire Pixel 7 spectrum though is that slow charging speeds available. I'm sure there's a case for cell longevity with limited charging because fast charging itself can degrade batteries as we all know. Even if that is an argument, it's no excuse for Google to offer such low top up speeds. Waiting over an hour to fully charge your phone in 2023 feels archaic. It's even worse when you consider that the 30 watt advertised speeds with the official charging companions isn't even available. This has been a constant annoyance that has been hard to overlook when using this phone on a daily basis. One of the few upsides though is that in my experience, I'm only charging once every couple of days, so that frustration is tempered somewhat. If you want the fastest charging, you're probably gonna have to look elsewhere, especially if you want that extra long battery on top of that too. So wrapping up this long-term look at the Pixel 7, I think one of the most prominent things to note is that in many ways, Google has more or less outdone itself with the Pixel 7 series. Our own expectations were pretty tempered ahead of the Made by Google 2022 reveal, 
The reason is that the device duo only really received minimal updates across the board, and these admittedly minor tweaks shouldn't have really made as much difference as they seem to have done. The Pixel 7 is not the biggest and best Google phone that you can currently buy, as I noted right at the stop, top of this video. It's more of a side note or an entry into the growing made by Google ecosystem for people who've maybe never used a Pixel before. Often an entry level model comes with some substantial compromises. Like the Pixel 6 though, the cost cutting measures are appropriate for a sub 600 device such as this. Last year, this actually resulted in a superior handset for better or worse. And unlike last year though, the Pro model is certainly a better buy if you're willing to front up that extra cash and want that full fat Pixel experience and arguably one of the best smartphone photography packages you can buy right now. Where Google has hit a home run though with the Pixel 7 is in the core package, as this hits or touches all of the main bases while reducing the glaring issues. With the Pixel 7a on the horizon and discounts already plentiful on the Pixel 7, if you just want a competent Android phone that has an exceptional main camera and some would say the best software experience, then the Google Pixel 7 is where you should look even six months into its life cycle, especially as I mentioned, now those discounts are available. Have you had the same experience or a good experience with the Pixel 7? Or do you not think highly of the Pixel 7 and hate it with a passion? We're all different. After a few misfires though, in many ways it feels like Google is slowly starting to find its feet with flagships once again. I wanna know though, what are your thoughts? Let me know down in the comment sections below. Until next time though, this is Damien with 9to5Google saying thanks for watching and I will speak to you later.